So um, hello and welcome everyone to our second and final panel of today's session for the conference. I am Shovik Kaur and I will be chairing this session. I am delighted to say that we have with us several very interesting presentations lined up and we hope to have a fruitful and fascinating discussion. I will request the audience to kindly keep their microphone and camera switched off for the duration of these presentations. Please use the chat box for posting your comments and questions, which we shall take up in the Q&A session at the end of this panel after all the papers had been presented. A reminder to the participants, you have 20 minutes for your individual presentations. I will have to unfortunately interrupt you once you go over the 20 minute mark. Um, so let's begin. Uh, Okay, so uh, our first paper for this session is Ochinto Devnath's uh, Psychoanalysis of Player Unknowns Battlegrounds or PUBG in the context of India 2020 to 2021. Ochinto Devnath is a student of history. He has done his master's from Presidency University and then he has cracked net and set for assistant professorship for colleges and universities. Now he is doing his MPhil at the Center for Studies in Social Science, Calcutta, India. Over to you now, Osinto. Are you there, Osinto? No, he says that he can't unmute himself. That is strange. Yes, but we can't see you. Oh, oh, I won't be able to. I won't be able to on my video camera. I am having very weak connection. Okay, that's so, all right. So are you all right. presenting just... a PowerPoint? presentation or are you no 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 i'm just going to read out my uh, right. paper Fantastic. i'm okay. just going to read out my paper okay a psychoanalysis of player unknowns battleground pubg in the context of india 2020 21 soon after the release of pubg player unknowns battleground game on 20th december in 2017 a cataclysmic change occurred in the virtual world of game such paradigm shifting game has attracted nearly more than 1 billion mobile accumulating within a very short period of time yet it is a very it is a subject of severe scrutiny for being a violent game furthermore in the context of banning it many countries such as india has oversimplified the psychoanalysis of violence throughout the year 2020-21 this ban on pubg sparked Genuine concern for many gamers, while for others, it signaled a political opportunity. Though the fact is that the ban doesn't last long and soon it returns again. Generally, it has often taken for granted that video games are associated with violence because most of them are particularly associated with shooters such as PUBG and Free Fire. <laughs> Both share the characteristics of violent games like murder, guns, and many other mature concepts, therefore giving them a bad reputation. Moreover, there was a significant positive relationship between moral dis disengagement and aggression for violent video games. This extension is important because it shows that exposure to violent video games can cause immoral behavior, especially among people high in moral disengagement. Nevertheless, initially in the 1970s, when video game play was introduced, the debates among about the negative effects of video game play play have been started. Therefore, the one billion mobile accumulating PUBG game has revived these concerns, reinvigorating re old debates and generating brand new ones in many countries in general and India in particular. To this contrast, my study will be a psychoanalysis understanding of controlling violence through the lens of PUBG game. Even though there has no dearth of sophisticated scholarly analysis on the psycho psychological effect of video games, such as the initial extensive work of 
Anderson introduced in the beginning of this century largely showed the negative moral disengagement as a consequence of playing video game, whereas Gareth Mukherjee, McLean, and Mark Griffith tried to show the intricate complex complexity of violent video games' ethics and its effect. Though the concept of moral disengagement involves the provision of context and pointers that make the player's action more justifiable within the gameplay. However, this notion too cannot be applied universally to all video games. To this vibrant scholarship done on the relation of violence and video game, notwithstanding, significant study has not been done so far on specific, specific games such as PUBG Free Fire. Precisely in the discourse of mobile users in the recent context of banning PUBG in India. Therefore, my analysis is greatly dependent on surveying mobile users and interviewing mobile gamers. Since as the perfect study doesn't exist in any domain of science, including video game research, it is highly unlikely to expect infallibility of this paper or precisely PUBG and Free Fire's positive side effects. Method, I simply just went to the various spots where gamers play the game and ask very basic, simple questions for this paper, such as when they started playing the game, how much do they play? Have they ever thought if it is okay to hit or sh shoot someone in real life? Does PUBG Free Fire cause violent behavior? What are the side effects? And so on and so forth. My survey includes a diverse group of 27 people coming from different social, religious, and economical backgrounds, as well as different ages. I interviewed 12 students, three of them 18 years old graduate students, rest of them schoolboy, aged between the 10 to 17, a PhD scholar, 29 years old, four unskilled laborer, an engineer, an electrician, a policeman, three unemployed college pass out, and four random fellows. All of them either play PUBG or Free Fire or both. Many of them are eager to talk to me while others are busy playing the game, as I have mentioned, the above squad team. Uh, there was a squad team. Uh, those who did give me an interview, uh, most of them started playing the game in the year 2018 and 2019. However, there are some people who have started much later. Nevertheless, um, this uh, I was uh, I I interviewed a, a ten-year-old boy uh, um, while I was uh, going to the market. I saw him uh, in front of the balcony. Uh, uh, of his home. So I asked him whether he would give me an interview or not. At first, he was scared of me. However, his mother knows my family, and soon she pursued the child for an interview. Uh, the 10 year school, the 10 years old school boy informs me that his mother called me if he plays PUBG. However, his mother is too a PUBG player. When I asked his mother about the PUBG game and as if she can give me an interview, she smiled at me. That means no. And told me that uh, she allows her son to play because outdoor playing is too risky. However, she claimed that playing PUBG can damages can his, her, her son's conventional learning abilities and can cause the so-called violent behavior, which is why she's called him. This shows a rather complicated issue where a mother believes playing PUBG can cause mental disturbances for children. However, it doesn't affect on her. One of the uh, school boy participant is a professional foot football player. Uh, so when I asked which he likes the most, he replied uh, he likes both the game. Then I asked differences between playing football and PUBG. He got confused and said both are enjoyable. Uh, also, he said his mother restricted him for, from playing too much PUBG game. His mother has this list of three days when he can play PUBG for an hour or two. However, it seems he's fooling his mother because at that day when I interviewed him, he was playing PUBG though he was, wasn't supposed to do, supposed to be. It's, it's, it seems simple enjoyment or innocent sin for him. These types are prevalent among schoolboys. While I was interviewing a 13 year old schoolboy, I realized that he was afraid of his mother because his mother forbid him to play the video game. However, he somehow managed to hide it from his mother and told, told me that uh, he is uh, fooling his mother too. Uh, anyway, he plays it regularly. All the participants who are aged about 20 disagree with the fact that PUBG can cause violent behavior. In fact, some of them laughed at the question. However, 
all of them agreed with the fact that like any other thing the video game has also two sides that sports is a positive side and another one is uh, negative it is up to us which side we are going to choose in this context gareth opined that uh, public uh, and political debates that prompt the notion of relationship between games uh, and violence have not emerged in response to logical events that permit game violence to be considered in dispassionate terms. When I ask how much they play the game, some of the teenagers, not all of them, told me that it depends on a depends on whether they have girlfriend or not however all of them agree that playing pubg in the lockdown increased a lot despite them having girlfriend or not many of them started playing pubg free fire to get out from boredom during the lockdown playing pubg might have a way to express personal relation uh, relational agony like uh, i had interviewed a, an unskilled laborer who got emotional when i was asking him about the pubg free fire game somehow he ends up telling his failed love affair Nevertheless, I had interviewed a 20 years old teenager who is a sophomore. Surprisingly, he is the only one who condemned the fact that a video game doesn't promote violence. More precisely, he confessed that he sometimes got angry and he caused damages. So, it so in this context, uh, the and 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 Anderson's argument is worthy of mention. Uh, he points out that each time people play be, uh, violent video games, they rehearse aggressive scripts that reach and reinforce vigilance for enemies, aggressive actions against others, expectations that others will behave ag aggressively, positive attitudes towards use of violence, and believe that violent solutions are effective and appropriate. However, my focus, however, my focus will be on the actual discrepancy within this dichotomy rather than agreeing it. As many recent scholars in the field such as Sovik Mukherjee opined that it would be unwise to suggest that killing a figure in a video game would enable a soldier to kill the enemy without any emotional response in the battle zone. Hence, my focus would be rather in the context of controlling violence to PUBG than the oversimplified view that is PUBG causing violence. Nevertheless, secret argued that computer games are complex cultural objects. They have rules guiding behavior. They create game walls with values at play, and they relate to players who like to explore moral, morals and actions forbidden in society. The ethics of computer games have to take into consideration all these variables. Nevertheless, the research on the negative effects of playing violent games has uh, has been based on the same theoretical frameworks used to test the impact of exposure to television and movie violence. However, video games contain specifics of its own. Interactivity, for instance, allows players a more active participation in the environment, also requiring higher attention and concentration. Factors like previous experience, perception, perception of control, competence, frustration, competitiveness, involvement, and sense of presence should also be taken into account. Furthermore, Secret argued that players are creative engaged ethical agents. Players no longer are passive moral creatures exposed to unethical con content. Computer game players reflect, relate, and create with an ethical mind and the games they play are ethical systems. Nonetheless, Mukherjee points out that uh, the virtue ethics is certainly a popular choice among commentator commentators on video, video game morality. He continued and argued that the that the experience of playing combat video games causes the player to experience a kind of trauma. However, this trauma is not comparable with that experience in the real world or any other real conflict, but rather that the player experiences milder forms of some of the characteristics of war trauma. The symptoms that video game players experience that emulate those experienced by the combat include disorientation due to a loss of visual markers, a fear of injury to their screen cell, tension due to ever-present danger and pressure to protect their comrades. Hence, it would be that, uh, that it is too simplistic to allege that 
this experience of trauma desensitizes the player desensitizes the player rather such an experience increases their awareness of the realities of war and primes the player of for the kind of emotions that they might experience in the battle zone anxiety tension fear loyalty and guilt like the simulations used for training within the military exposure to such emotional responses better equips the player to prepare coping strategies but it would be unwise to suggest that killing a figure in a video game would enable a soldier to kill the enemy without any emotional response in the battle zone it depends on what rhetoric is used in their construction but inevitably our actions depend on our own emotional responses to these games so So humans are prone to violence in the beginning of the initial days of civilization civilization to the end of 20th century there are ample numbers of wars battles and the two great evil wars which had shaken the basis of humanity all this happens much before the invention of violent video games so my argument is that or my conclusion is that violent content doesn't affect how people act rather it depends on many primary primary factors such as perspectives mental state ability of consuming facts etc here is my references hello Yes. Um, have you reached Can your you computer? See? Uh, are you trying to yes. present something? Are you trying to share your screen? Yes. Yes. I am trying to share my uh, references. Um, yes. You can share your screen now. I have given you screen sharing privileges. Can you see my screen? No. Uh, no, we can't. I'm trying. Just hang on, hang on a sec. Sure, sure, sure. I'm trying. Um, Ochinto, you could also paste, copy, paste your references in the chat box, if it is a, if it is okay. okay. Okay, I will. I will copy paste. Or you can share. Reference. If you you can try to share the screen, but if it doesn't work, you can. I couldn't be able to find the options there. Right. The um, share screen should be like a green like share screen option right in the middle. Uh, yes. It, 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 yes, right, I have right clicked the, the I have clicked the icon. I have cl clicked the icon that share that says share screen, but now it's not working. I don't know something might have been raw, gone wrong. Okay. So you can then simply copy and paste your references in the chat box. Okay, then I will copy the references. Thank you. This is my presentation. That's all. Thank right. you. Thank you so much, Osinto. Um, okay, so moving into our second paper for this session is Poonam Chaudhary's Game Over, Spirituality of Death in Spirit Fairer. Poonam Chaudhary, uh, she slash her, is a PhD student at the Indian and World Literatures Department, English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad, India. Her research interests include mindful gaming, indie video games, empathy and play, game spaces, gender issues in video games, and slow gaming. She is a founding member of the newly formed Indian chapter of Digital Games Research Association, um, uh, uh, DIGRA, formerly known as Game Studies India Adda Initiative, she is also one of the two diversity officers and finance officers here. She also leads the special interest group on computational humanities and computational analytics for Digital Humanities Alliance for Research and Teaching Innovations, 30. Over to you now, Poonam. Okay, so you seem to be having some trouble with your video or mic. Um, right, okay. Uh, just a second. Yeah, I think I can speak now. But the video thing says uh, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay, you can start your video now, I think. Just, just try it once.
I think it's working. Yes, it's working. Yes, we can see you. Yes, I'm visible. Yes. All right. So I'll I'll share my screen. Just a sec. Right, I hope my screen is visible and I shall present. Right? Um, it's still safe. Right, yes, we can see your screen now. All right. right, great. Please continue. Um, hi, hi everybody. This is Poonam and Shobhik has already introduced me really well. Thank you for that. And I'm so excited to do this talk today. And this is a game that I'm super uh, passionate about. I recently finished it. I wanted to do a paper on it. So yes. Can I switch off my camera now? Uh, I would like to. No, sure, that. go ahead. Just a second. Oh, well, I don't, I don't think I can find the option. Um, anyway, just bear with me looking at a paper while trying to manipulate the screen. All well, right, so <laughs> thanks. So um, my topic, the, the topic of my paper is game over, spirituality of death and spirit fairer. Now the word death, is uh, isn't the most appealing way to start a conversation or to open a presentation even but uh, it, but despite being such an such an extremely natural and inevitable phenomenon it's extremely uncomfortable in our minds and it happens to all living things this and still it's still it's the one it's one of the most uncomfortable things that we just do not like to talk about um, amongst the existential philosophers, we have school of, schools of thought that rep, uh, represented by philosophers such as Heidegger, Jasper, Sartre, who have tried to assess the meaning of uh, human life constrained by the finality of death. In psychotherapy, uh, we have loads of psychotherapists, psychologists, psychologists such as Sigmund Freud, uh, Wendy uh, Yalom in his existential psychotherapy, in fact, works on and uh, discusses death as an essential theme that helps us find the meaning of life. In fact, uh, in all religions, to a huge extent, in, in, in all, like I said, in almost all religions, I'm not, I'm not fully versed with all religions of the world. Uh, but uh, in fact, all religions, sorry, almost all religions try to explain the phenomenon of death, try to quantify what, is, uh, what does life mean in terms of death and dying. And there are lots of uh, rituals that are involved, lots of hymns and mantras are chanted, lots of rituals that are performed when, uh, when a person dies from that, from a community. Now coming to death in video games, uh, death in video games are either trivialized, as there's this wonderful paper by Gonzalo Frasca that you can find online, and uh, they're either trivialized or they are considered a failed state. Um, and there are only a few games that deal with uh, that deal with death meaningfully as a theme, such as the graveyard, every day the same dream, one chance, the dragon, cancer, etc. Now, Spirit Fairer is this uh, brilliant game that came out last year, and uh, it was advertised as a cozy management game about dying. But in reality, to me, it turned out to be a slow-paced affective game on life that dealt with life, grief, reflection, acceptance, and letting go. This slow contemplative game was released at an apt time during the peak of the pandemic that India is still struggling, struggling with. Now, Spiritfarer isn't the first game that Thunder Lotus made about death and love and afterlife, in fact. The first game, Jotun, or Jotun, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, uh, is about uh, Thora, a, Vi a Viking woman who has recently passed away. She must travel through different realms and defeat Jotuns. Uh, and defeat Jotuns. In the end, she even faces Odin himself and ascends to Valhalla. In the second game, Sundered, uh, the, the protagonist Eshe has to fight monsters and machines while navigating the underworld. In Spirit Pharaoh, however, 
we play the player plays as Stella and or Daffodil. You get the option to play as Daffodil, the cat, if you play co-op. Uh, and collect spirits from far off islands. You take care of them, listen to their life stories, do tasks for them, and deliver them to Evador in the end. Each task, each task the spirit uh, spirits ask Stella to con complete helps them contemplate their own life and realize that realize the burdens that they have been carrying uh, that they, their emotional luggage that baggage that they have been carrying all these all these years and then they in, in the end they reach a sort of acceptance and they kind of accept their fate and then they uh, go to evador and ask stella to take them to the take them to the evador and help them leave the afterlife the game starts with Stella, like I said, the protagonist of the game, being handed over the psychopomp duties uh, from a grim looking uh, Karen, Sharon, uh, the, the Greek uh, word for a psychopomp. Uh, she is tasked with the job of seeking lost spirits wandering around distant land, islands and forests. Each spirit she successfully brings to the ship, give her uh, an obol that she uses at different uh, at different shrines to get different abilities the creators of the game have confirmed to using a lot of greek mythology mythological elements in greek mythology karen is a ferryman uh, who takes obols and helps departed souls across the river styx in return a similar figure is also found in many schools of hinduism by the name of tarakeshwara who is an avatar of lord shiva and acts as a ferryman slash deliverer of souls towards moksha Similar to Karen's Obol, in many Hindu, uh, Hindu death rituals, a coin is placed on the forehead of the deceased, which is supposed to help them pay the ferry ticket when their soul crosses over. In the game, all the spirits are reborn as uh, different spirits. Um, as, sorry, the spirits are reborn as different animals, and they are, as Gwen says in the very beginning of the game, that uh, the, 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 the animal form that they assume is their true is what they are in, in the, on the inside. She doesn't explain it further though, and that's all we hear about it, but uh, yes. So yes, they, uh, they are reborn. The, all the spirits are uh, kind of lost all around the world of spirit fairer. And then Stella has to travel to these distant places and she finds these lost souls. And when they come to the ship, they transform into either a deer or a lion or a hedgehog or uh, or a, or a dog even and then um yes uh, life on the ship is slow and they get ample time to reflect on the past karma and process their difficult emotions with stella each character is unique and has a memorable personality and have they all have memorable personalities that you come to miss when you drop them off at Evador. If, if, when their quests come to an end and they accept their life journeys, they, gain, they go to the over, Everdoor gate and turn into constellations. For example, this is Gwen. She, uh, her, character, her, her personality was again very uh, quite interesting. She was, a, she, she was a rebellious kind of a person from a very young age. She picked up smoking at a very young age just to be kind of, just to kind of go against her father. She's, sophistic, she's sophisticated, she eats comfort foods but also quite um, she's quite picky about her foods also she died young of lung issues then we have atul he is one of the most lovable characters in the game he's very joyful he's extremely uh, happy and eats everything and loves hugs and uh, showers stella with wonderful compliments but then um, turns out in the middle of the game that um, he just vanishes and uh, from what we heard from the uh, uh, from the makers of the game, the character is inspired from one of the team members' um, uncles who had committed suicide and just vanished um, one fine day. Uh, then we have Summer. She is one of the most spiritual uh, character. Sorry, spirits in the game. She only eats vegan food. Uh, she even teaches Stella how to meditate. That's one of the most interesting uh, things about about this game is that uh, you, you she has you can find these spots meditative spots and you can just go there and start meditating and it's, it's quite it's quite calming uh, sadly she had uh, she had died of can cancer in her past life and uh, 
she returns as a snake in this on the ship but again no reasons are given as such why she has turned into why she is showing up as this animal but yeah then we have alice she is a lovely homely lady loves simple food but uh, the game uh, deals with her dementia really well really sensitively and it she and it's quite quite sad when she uh, asks to leave the ship and we have the lovely toxic couple on board giovanni and astrid um astrid is this wonderful strong lady and giovanni is this uh, human not human uh, embodiment of spiritual embodiment of carpe diem and he loves to flirt around loves to eat a lot of strange foods and he is just fun to just just fun to be around then we have Gustav, he's, artist, he's artistic, he loves exotic food, he gives expensive gifts to Stella. But uh, what's interesting is that um, I have to bring this here, bring this point here that when the game was initially made, this character was uh, kind of this character as in the human character of this, as in the past life of Gustav. Uh, in that uh, past life, he was wheelchair uh, bound and the, the, there was a lot of controversy that this character had uh, caused because of certain dialogues. I won't get into that. I'll come to that later in the q and section if I have the time. We have Stanley. He is the youngest on the ship. Very playful, lovely kid. He hates vegetables. Uh, even he, he even hates pizza because it has vegetables on it. Very sensitive. And he, I think, uh, he had, a, in, his, in his past life, he had a, a rare disease that had caused that had and he had and he passed away at the age of eight and yeah next we have mickey and bruce they are the goonish brothers bully everybody bully stella we have but they but uh, when the game progresses we see that where that aggression is coming from they have had a difficult background they've had a difficult childhood and they love expensive pub food even though they don't have the stomach for it uh, mickey is in fact allergic to lobster but he keeps ordering it because it's expensive Elena is uh, one of the most annoying. She has or she's, she gets a lot of hate on Reddit, etc., because she's extremely strict. She she is very competitive. She asks Stella to do very strange tasks for her. She hates hugs, which is a big, which was very strange for me because in this game has the dedicated hug button, and she's the only spirit in the game who hates hugs, and her mood uh, meter falls if if Stella goes and hugs her. Next we have Buck. Uh, Buck is a love is a lovely teenage guy. Loves RPGs. Loves pizza, as you can see. He he also died young. He was in past in the past life. He was Stella's uh, sister's friend. But well, we see him on the ship too. And then in the end, we have Stella. Uh, I would like to speak a little bit on that. Um, where, where did that go? Yes, on the surface, this lovely game is about a fairy master named Stella and the spirits she helps cross over. But as we proceed in the game, we come to know that the world of Spirit Ferrer is something she has created in her mind to cope with her own impending death from cancer. She has worked as a palliative uh, uh, care nurse all her life, and in the last month, in, in, in her last moments, she's ruminating on all the people who, are, who she had gotten attached to and who have left lasting impressions on her, on her. So some of the spirits that we see on the ship, some of them are people from her own life. Suppose Atul was one of her uncles, Astrid and um, Giovanni were her grandparents. But, uh, but some of the other characters in the ship that we see, they are simply her past patients that have left a lasting impact on her. She has kind of uh, worked as a medical psychopomp, if you will. And initially, although it feels that the spirits are the only ones letting go and accepting afterlife at Everdo, it is later revealed through conversations with this scary looking owl that a lot of people call Hades in Reddit uh, threads and everything. The, the name isn't given to that character. In conversations with that character, we realize that it's her mind that is playing, that, is, that has made up this wonderfully detailed uh, world. Uh, Stella needs to eventually Stella, Stella has to uh, needs to accept her own impending death and needs to let go of her memories and attachments to the material world she also learns about the confusing emotions uh, the idea of death cause causes through the alternate world that she has created and she eventually lets go and she becomes a part of the constellation in the sky and the game ends 
which was uh, quite a sad scene for all the players who have completed the game. Uh, video games like Spirit Fairer that cause uh, that cause and encourage deep reflections about death and makes the players question what life is could be considered a serious could be considered serious games in the sense that it goes beyond pure entertainment and involves education and an attitude change towards death as uh, talked about by uh, Luca Chitaro and Ricardo Sioni in the wonderful paper. Uh, Spirit Fairer could also qualify as an art game if we go by Tiffany Holmes and the Philippa Stalker's definition of art games. Tiffany Holmes says that art games are inter as interactive are interactive works by by a visual artist that does one or more of the following: challenge cultural stereotypes, offer meaningful social or historical critique, or tell a story in a novel manner. Philippa Jane Stalker divides art games into aesthetic games, that is, games that use the game medium to express an artistic purpose and agenda-based art and agenda-based art games, that is, games that have some sort of ulterior motive that other than as aesthetics, such as bringing an issue to the public attention to attract support and understanding for the cause. Uh, and this, um, additionally, Carlos uh, Mauricio Castano, Castiano Diaz and Warwick uh, Tungjit uh, Tung Karyan in their 2014 paper highlight that it is not sufficient for art games to contain pieces of art but they must also be able to provide an experience of reflection outside of gameplay that is uh, provoke feelings and reactions in the person interacting with the game reflection through design uh, so spirit fairer has all the elements of a slow game in my opinion uh, the game makes you cook fish uh, talk hug grow plants travel mine everything rather slowly kind of frustrating you slowly in the beginning. The lower levels of actions required from the player kind of forces them to focus focus on the slow activities a lot more and it makes you question makes you kind of uh, contemplate about what is happening in the game about what is whatever is happening in the background of a certain task in the game. These activities, uh, these activities seem annoyingly boring in the beginning, but one grows fond of it eventually. The game even has dedicated meditation spots for meditation which was talked to Stella, like I said earlier, by Summer, who is the most spiritual on the ship. Uh, the game even emphasizes on rest quite a lot. Uh, and the in-game uh, sun, after the in-game sun sets in the game, the ship doesn't navigate anymore and you are expected to go to sleep in your cabin. Sleeping makes the next day come faster, which can be avoided in, ca in case you want to attend to different shows in the middle of the night while everybody is sleeping or some are snoring. Uh, slow paced gameplay has been described as particularly suitable to encourage reflection, contemplation and learning, according to Tim Marsh in his lovely paper. Uh, the expression slow technology was originally proposed this, uh, this, uh, this way of looking at games uh, uh, of analyzing slow serious games has, kind of, has come from slow technology, which the idea of which was first proposed by Lars Salnas and Johan Redstrom. Uh, but although slow movement has been around for quite some time now, but uh, yeah, this uh, it is, uh, Tim Marsh's paper was quite influenced by um, Halnas and Redstrom's paper. Uh, right, so uh, yes, the expression slow, slow technology was originally proposed by Lars Halnas and Johan Redstrom, and it uh, so he's they say that in the in the paper they said that to describe technology that takes they they use the term to use they use the term to describe technology that takes user time to learn how it to learn how it works to understand why it works the way it works to apply it to see what it is and to find out the consequences of using it this approach can be followed in any technology based experience, for example, Halnas and Redstrom explore these you explore the use of slow technology in a work of art uh, and in a piece of music in the same paper that I've mentioned here. Um, I'm kind of good, approaching the end of my paper and I'm, I'm going to talk about not exactly talk about, but I'm going to mention this lovely movie here, which uh, which the which the makers have admitted that they drew a lot of inspiration from. 
so uh, this is the this is a picture from the studio ghibli movie called spirited away uh, the game's premise and aesthetic is reminiscent of this lovely game and uh, they have even the the makers were in in an interview they were telling the in, in the interviewee that uh, no the interviewer that uh, they want they initially wanted there has a there's a ship in the game which stella is uh, that, that Stella sails basically, and they had initially planned to make it into a train, but then um, they kind of resorted with the idea of the ship instead. So I had a lot of inspiration from this lovely movie. And uh, they were quite uh, inspired by the idea of a retreat slash hotel for departed spirits, for tired spirits. Incidentally, in uh, Varanasi, uh, many establishments along the banks of river uh, River Ganges called Mukti Bhavans, uh, called death hostels by foreigners, offer lodging at nominal prices. One is guaranteed to attain moksha if they die in Varanasi. These hostels slash hot hotels are for people who can sense that they are approaching death and have detached from their friends and families. That is, we, we call we call it people call it samsara in the in the preparation of their uh, uh, oncoming death. There's also a lovely movie uh, that was made on this idea of Mukti Bhavans. It's called Hotel Salvation in English. And give it a watch. It's on Netflix, I think. And this, in this movie, this movie also talks about the ending, the, when you have a terminal illness or when you know that when your death is approaching, the way people deal with it, the, the way people deal with acceptance, letting go, and how the family deals with it, in fact. Uh, all right, so I'll move to the last bit of my presentation. This is this is just a tiny, small con uh, observation that I had made that, that I was thinking about while playing this game. As uh, in 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 the in the many uh, in in the many Indic religious philosophies, death isn't considered an end. Even if you die and don't attain moksha the first time, you have n number of chances to make things right in your next in incarnations. We're also advised to live a life of dhyan, that is reflection, and contemplation, that is mindfulness, and seva, that is service. In fact, the kind of care that Stella offers to her patients towards the end is kind of normal and expected in our culture. Palliative care isn't common here, and sometimes we, the children or relatives, have to be the Stella to our loved ones. With that, I come to the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Poonam. Um, right. Oh no, am I visible? Am I not visible? Um, you're still visible, Poonam. Are you having trouble switching off your camera? No, I just see the screen as in the background. I don't see myself. Uh, anyway, well, I think you're it's, lost. Fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Cool, cool. All right. Right. Okay. Um, thank you, Poonam. Our third paper for this session is Zinia Zaila and Satyajit Chakraborty's Durga Puja Behind the Borders, Teaching Indian Festival Culture Through Video Games. Zinia Zaila's research and teaching are situated at the intersection of digital media, culture, and society, specifically as related to India and the global Indian community. Her research for Sai are video games and gaming in India, digital religion, especially Hinduism, global Hinduism and tantric traditions. She also researches and teaches aspects of global digital humanities and popular culture, especially as related to India. Satyajit believes in being a versatile game designer with over 20 years in media and entertainment. He founded Flying Robot Studios, an indie game development studio in 2012, and has worked with clients like Missing Link Trust, the University of Helsinki, and J.H. Piego, John Hopkins University affiliate. His games have won several awards, including NASCOM Game of the Year in 2016 and World Summits Awards in 2019. Over to you now, Zinia and Satyajit. Hello, everyone. Can you Yes, now I'm sorry, I had trouble unmuting myself. 
Um, back to screen sharing, and thank you so much for this kind introduction, of course. Um, and let me go up if I can. Yes, there we are. Um, as we heard, this is a joint presentation between me and Satyajit. Uh, we thought it makes sense because of the theme of what we are going to talk uh, about uh, via remaining with serious games, which we already had triggered now by Poonam. Uh, and actually, we are remaining in a very specific form of serious games that is uh, educational games. We want to introduce introduce you uh, a bit to the theoretical framework of what ed educational games are, what they can be used for. And also, of course, we have a very concrete example, a new educational game, Durga Puja Beyond Borders. So I'll start and Satyajit will follow. To set the frame, video games, uh, we all know that among other things, can be used for transmitting information or knowledge about certain subjects. And especially educational games do so in a very conscious and in a very straightforward way. That is, they are developed specifically to either teach or in a more subtle way to draw attention to or offer background knowledge on certain topics. And quite a number of studies, uh, quite a number of academic studies actually by today speak about the additional benefit of the especially immersion and emotional factors which you can um, trigger or even involve with educational games. Um, and of course, this is an additional value as compared to traditional teaching. Uh, gamification is all around us. It has um, been implemented in basically all um, levels of society, including in education. Um, the term gamification is not used for the first time in academia, but actually in the industry, in the design industry. But when it comes to academic research, uh, by today we basically have two um, accepted definitions, understanding of what gamification actually means. And they differ a bit. You can see them both on the slide. Uh, the first interpretation or definition says that video games are increasingly institutionalized, which is of course true, and they gain impact in society. And then there is this trend to gamify all aspects of life. And this definition can, it not necessarily must, but it can have a partly negative connotation. Uh, there is a second definition or understanding, and that says that uh, video games can be used not only for entertainment, but they may be fruitfully employed to enhance the player, that is the learner, engagement and motivation. And of course, this is a positive, a throughout positive connotation. And as you might imagine, this is the stance that I also take um, when it comes to educational games. Um, these educational games or serious games more generally are also at times called edutainment, which is a term which was coined by Michael and Chen in 2006. And when it comes to the academic study of educational video games, we find the first comprehensive publication on that in 2007 by Mishra and Foster. And actually they make five claims, you can see them here, uh, which um, are still very relevant today. That is the development of the cognitive, practical, um, physiological and social skills and the motivation of the player slash learner. When we look at the existing educational video games, uh, we can see quite quickly, immediately, that a lot of them focus on the so-called STEM subjects, especially on mathematics. Uh, language learning, uh, language acquisition is another large mm -hmm. um, theme field for educational video games. Um, and B, also games for kids dominate uh, 
uh, the market when it comes to educational video games. That is the full potential of educational video games in a way still needs to unfold. But then we have examples um, of beautiful educational video games uh, about all kinds of humanities themes by today. And even in the very small discipline of South Asian studies in which I teach and research, uh, we find first developments. Um, this is um, a video game, an educational video game called the Doga Puja Mystery, which was developed um, by us. That is the team uh, Xenia from Helsinki and Satyajit and his team from Kolkata. And um, to the best of my knowledge, this is indeed the first ever educational video game in South Asian studies, referring to um, South Asian, in this uh, case, Indian or um, possibly even Bengali uh, culture, uh, it centers on Durga Puja. Um, it is important to know and to keep in the back of your head that this game was designed aiming specifically at non-Indian audiences, that is, it was designed to uh, support learners, students of South Asian studies and other disciplines, but also the generally interested public uh, who do not know about Durga Puja yet. So they will have no background knowledge. They can build on or potentially very little, though that also is the exception. That is, this game was designed as an introduction to Indian festival culture, taking Durga Puja as an example. Uh, based on these um, experiences which we had with this game development process and because we were lucky to gain um, a bit more of uh, seed funding, we proceeded to develop a second educational game which is very, very new. It came out only in September this year. It's called Durga Puja Beyond Borders. Sorry for the spelling mistake. Uh, I can just see that uh, in the title. So Durga Puja Beyond Borders, as the name indicates, is um, a video game which focuses on Durga Puja as it is organized and celebrated outside of India. That is in Indian migrant communities. In our case, it was the Helsinki Durga Puja, uh, which was a kind of a model for this uh, game. It differs um, a lot from the first game, not only in content, but also in execution. And I think Satyajit um, can say a bit more about that. Just as a summary, um, it uh, content-wise, it focuses um, on how Indian migrant communities, um, how important festivals, joint celebrations at festivals and joint organization of festivals, how, uh, how these are very, very important venues um, to celebrate, to live, to share and to negotiate the own identity the identity, uh, this, this um, aspects of, of, of jointly doing things, this looking forward to the joint celebrations of Durga Puja um, that includes families coming from the north of Finland all the way to Helsinki just to be with the community. So these are important things that are highlighted in this video game. And um, for that, of course, it was important that we did communicate with and involve the Helsinki Doga Puja Festival uh, in both the organizing processes and the celebration processes. That is that I joined the celebrations and uh, also organizational meetings before um, in two occasions, in two Doga Pujas in two different years, all pre-pandemic. And also Satyajit and I both spoke to members of the community and to the organizers. And this is where Satyajit comes in and I'm handing over. Well, hello, Rudy. Can you hear me properly? 
So yeah, this is my uh, voice. Okay, so oh, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Zania, for the introduction. And I, I think I've, I've been already introduced, so I, I'll skip this part. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, right. So uh, of course, like uh, I'm a game designer, so I'll I'll just uh, give a little bit uh, snippets on how we approach this project and and how. Uh, anybody else can do this kind of stuff uh, with this knowledge as well. So the thing is like uh, our goals over there were, were pretty much uh, surround, uh, which it began with like on with the research, of course, like it's an educational game, so it's a research about the subject and to actually come up with a sponsor, which is uh, kind of, which fits the context and fits the thing uh is the main main challenge so after that we have to kind of take care of like to actually spread the narrative uh, that the whole educational narrative uh from the text to every element of the game like uh the environment the characters the dialogues the puzzles and everything uh it cannot be for kind of concentrated on a, like a text base so it should be kind of spread out throughout in the items, in the inventory, uh, in the obstacles, everywhere. So um, now for the fun part, we actually went on um, already popular game mechanics like adventure games or management games, this kind of stuff, where it, uh, it was enough to actually carry the player through the game and player would be, will be having a really fun time actually to play the game. Because the games are actually pretty much playable as game, as a, as a regular game, right? But with all the knowledge behind it and helping it to cross the obstacles. The designing the game obstacles in the way that uh, this critical knowledge is, uh, uh, this knowledge is very critical to actually overcome the game obstacles. So anybody, just anybody won't be, I don't think it would, uh, they would be, able to play this game as smoothly as a well-versed uh, uh, student on that subject. So, and also like whenever we, we make the knowledge base available inside the game itself, uh, it was partially done in the first game, the Doga Puyo Mystery, and it was mostly fully done in the second game, where the player can actually refer back to the knowledge base, the knowledge bank anywhere uh, during the facing the challenge and crawl, kind of come back and finish the game. So that was in a nutshell, like uh, how we approach these challenges, uh, design challenges in this game. Uh, let's go, go on to the next slide. I'll um, get, kind of start with the first game that we did over there, Durga Puja Mystery. It's a, it's a uh, proper 3D, uh, Third person game, PC game, uh, with a story set in a like a mm, nice uh, zamindar house in the suburbs of Calcutta. You can find this kind of king, kingly kind of big houses, palatial houses, buildings all over near the Cal near Calcutta, and they're pretty popular. So, and we set up a little bit of a detective and adventure game in a night where something gets stolen and you have to be found, lost and found kind of stuff like that. A main uh, palette of uh, detective game was used over there. Now, uh, very carefully we spread out this narrative everywhere. The whole, uh, the culture was spread into the, every bit of the elements, the designs of the house, the characters, the, the, um, the items, uh, even the, I won't be giving out a lot of spoilers, but there were many, many cultural iconographies, puzzles and stuff like that. So the player experience was mostly like they would be playing as proper adventure game and, and in the meanwhile, they, the game will be requiring some knowledge on the subject. So, so they can either use their uh, already um, the knowledge they have or they can refer, uh, pause the game, refer back to Google it out, whatever, read books that were referenced in this game, and then come back again uh, and can, uh, kind of address this challenge. So the challenges were designed 
in that way. So it ends at the all the tension of the detective game and the adventure game is there, as well as the knowledge and the education elements. So that was the the first game, Durga Puja Mystery, a third person game. And next we did this Durga Puja Beyond Border. It was a very different game. First, the first game was a PC game. This is a mobile game, first of all. Now and that was set in Kolkata. This was set in. This is set in Helsinki, Finland. So, and the genre is also very different. The first of all, one was a third-person adventure game. This is more like a event management management game that people love to play in uh, mobile using mobiles and browser and stuff like that. So, because it was a management game, so there were a lot of inventories, dialogues, and um, challenges to do. Many event to handle. So after researching uh, quite a bit with uh, Zenia, with the actual organizers of this uh, puja that happens in uh, Helsinki, uh, with the with the committee members and all, so we figured out how the exact event happens. So and the, all the game puzzles were designed based upon the actual happenings of the event. How the um, idol of the statue or idol, the Dugubuja idol is taken out, and what the proceedings are, are kind of a uh, uh, kind of documentary. The whole game is a documentary of how uh, uh, Dugubuja happens in places like uh, Helsinki or likewise in many parts throughout the world. So, um, and also like it is quite the end, it's very di different than we uh, that we expect uh, that we experience in India. So it has its own culture, its own significance, and own um, kind of vibe. So we try to include all of that into this uh, the game's narrative, the you the, the the little chats and everything that the player character do. Most importantly, the even though these two games are uh, separate, they are related to the main character, Laura. So Laura is uh, in the first game, and um, she is uh, also in the second game. Uh, the main character is the same, and sometimes she refers back to the first games and its uh, uh, experiences as well in the second game. So there is a connection, and that also worked out uh, nicely. Uh, now, the knowledge of this even proceedings were very important over there. Uh, this, like how this Durga Puja happens and uh, how this thing kind of goes on day by day. Uh, and also like we introduced a mentor in the second game and a library where the players can uh, kind of refer back uh, to actually when they are stuck with a particular challenge in life. So this little changes and this amalgamation of educational uh, content and games uh, were pretty exciting for us to do in, uh, in these two projects. Uh, and uh, we thank uh, Xenia and University of Helsinki for the opportunity as well. Thank you. So that would be all. God, no, it is us who have to thank you, obviously. <laughs> it was a wonderful collaboration. And um, I just wanted to add one last thing, um, because, um, again, we were speaking about an educational uh, video game which targets also, among other things, university students. Uh, it was quite important um, uh, for us to locate this game um, uh, in, in, in academic context. Uh, that is, we have a rather uh, elaborative website where both games are hosted. And in case you're interested, by the way, this is also the place where you would find instructions how to download. It's super simple, everything. Uh, but here on the website, we also have academic uh, um, lectures. We have an uh, academic documentary about uh, how Durga Puja is celebrated in the south of India. So all kind of colleagues contributed here. We have a blog or two blog posts uh, about alternative lenses of the um, Asur community, how they uh, perceive Durga Puja, all this is uh, visible on this website. And last not least, of course, we want to acknowledge our funders. Uh, that is the University of Helsinki, the Digi Loika initiative. Thanks for much and we'll be happy to answer questions in case you have them. 
Sorry. We are going to have a Q&A session right at the end of the session after all the talks have been done. So please stick around for that. And I think we will have very fascinating questions for both of you guys. Thank you so much. Right. So again, thank you, Zinia and Satyajit. Our final paper for this session is Hario Pambuko Jivandono's Rethinking Ashura's Wrath as an Ep Indian Epic. He is a communication studies lecturer at Browijawa University's Department of Communication Studies. His main research expertise is digital game studies with specialization on interpretation of games and digital ethnography. Over to you now, Hario. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sophie, for the um, introduction. I would like to share my um, PowerPoint presentation, if possible. Okay, um, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my talk will be on how we can rethink um, Ashura's rap itself is a um, a Japanese game released back in 2012, which is inspired by um, Indian uh, mythology. And I found there are interesting uh, similarities. There are interesting um, simulations, we can say, of the structures of Indian epic into uh, the game. So, I'm sorry. Okay, so, um, the background is that Ashra's Wrath is a Japanese uh, hack and slash game, which is unique due to its um, emphasis on storytelling over players' contingency. So if we ever play games like um, Devil May Cry or perhaps the um, Bayonet or, or the, uh, it's, it's a contemporary, so similar game which are released um, again in, 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 in Japan. Um, there are fundamental differences in which that Ashra's Rats does not generally allow um, quote unquote uh, free playing uh, from players, but instead they is, the Ashra's Rats gameplay is very choreographed and players are afforded generally with more limited ludic possibilities um, compared to several games that I have mentioned uh, earlier. As you can see in the um, pictures, Blow the text, um, stylistic uh, gameplay, um, stylistic rules, if we want to refer that into the formal elements of a uh, video game, and QTE on the quick time events are main ludic features of Ashra's Red. So let's, for everybody who has not played the game, so let's put it into this way that Ashra's Red is more similar to um, interactive um, anime, perhaps a bit similar to um, Walking Dead, the games, or or Heavy Rain that uh, once again that uh, was released uh, around the same time with 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 Asteroid Sweat. So that's what we can say as the um, or say again as the um, how we can um, frame the Asteroid Sweat uh, gameplay. And also um, Asteroid Sweat draws inspirations from Indian culture in both iconographies and theme. As you can see, the pictures on the left is Asura's Gauntlets, which takes inspiration from um, ancient Indian um, war gauntlet. And they're also using, uh, so again, a naming convention, which can be traced into uh, their Indian origins, um, as you can see on the pictures on the right. There are three motivations why I would like to conduct this uh, research. So this is still a work in progress, which I believe um, my participation um, at DIGRA India 2021 um, conference can help me into, um, you can say like refining this paper and give me a better direction about what I can discuss on this, on this uh, paper or the, for the future. So there are three motivations, uh, but chiefly, um, the motivation is to diversify the perspective of digital game text. 
as has been argued by uh, Phil Panik Stetson, there is a domination of game production from the global north. So we refer a bit to the, um, the global um, political economy um, circumstances of the political economy constellation, we can say, of a video game industry in which the global north countries such as uh, Western Europe, Western European countries and North American countries are positioned as the core countries in digital game um, industry in general, while uh, countries in the global south are often positioned as uh, peripheries or consumer countries, so to speak. So what's the consequences of that? The consequences is that um, the possibility to articulate um, non-Western cultural identity in digital games are, uh, again, uh, become more difficult, so so to speak. You can, you can call this become more difficult. And also it's been argued by scholars such as Sophie Muherji and Sabine Harrer um, in their works about, uh, so again, uh, games and the um, uh, cultural identity of the, um, of the non-Western perspective. There are many uh, times where the articulation of non-Western um, cultural identity, which unknowingly, um, we can say like reproduce the, um, the, the, the cultural identity of Western, but only reskin it into, into something that superficially looks like it is non-Western, but at core, it still, um, it still produce um, Western cultural identity. And also I see Digra India as a platform to discuss um, digital games, um, Indianness in the way that how we can see how, um, how we can see that digital games have uh, distinctive um, Indian characteristic, distinctive um, trait that come from, from India and how, how is it again, it can be discussed further in, in this um, forum. But we look, before we go further into um, examining the shell layer or the semiotic richness and the core layer or the main logic structures of Asherah Schwartz, I would like to describe a bit of my reading about the structure of Indian um, epic and how as a um, non-Western literature, it differs from the um, Western lit literature that, be that often becomes the um, the, the roots or the cradle of um, digital games analysis. So Blackburn et al. Um, argue that the uh, Indian Mahakavya or Indian epic is distinct from Western epic in both theme and delivery. Uh, Mahakavya emphasize on human fatalism and celestial um, essentialism as opposed to Western epics focus on human subjectivity. And also the delivery of Mahakavya is more formulaic and more um, ornamental compared to Western epics, uh, more formal and more traditional uh, format of storytelling. Next, we can see how the narrative of Indian epic is being um, represented in Asura's Red. So the first is, I uh, would like to discuss that there are three um, acts of the Asura's Red. So the um, the the opening so giving the exposition of the game and then the um the the main content of the game itself which tells the story of conflict between um asuras and his former um demigod compatriots and finally the in the closing um act of asuras rats it discuss about the cycle of um, destruction and reborn all of the uh, narratives can be traced into um, Indian um, epics. There are, it, it can all be traced into the, the, the narratives of Indian epics. So as I mentioned earlier, the first act tells the story of struggle between um, demigods and the, the, the Goma, so the main um, enemies factions of Asuras Wax, akin to the struggle between the Devas and Asuras in Indian epics, such as the Mahabharata. So as we look at the picture on the left is the um, eight guardian generals. So the, I guess in the analogies, the analogies of um, um, Devas in the, in, the, in the games, while 
I was it again, the gomas, um, non, non picture in the in the slide, um, are the monstrous um, giants, the monstrous titans who become the enemies of the devas, and they've been locked into the battle for um, almost uh, an eternity. As we can see that how the such struggles also um, occur between the devas uh, uh, races and the um, asuras races in the Indian Mahabharata. Secondly, the narrative led a shift in the game's second act into an intra-celestial conflict between Asura, the game's protagonist, and his former demigod compatriots who betrayed him. So this is not unlike the conflicts between the Pandavas and the Kauravas in the, again, the, the Bharata Yuda um, epic. As we see in the pictures on the left, this, um, this picture depicts the, once again, the, the scene where Asura is being banished into the into, into hell due to him being framed as the um, as the as the traitor um, as the murderer of the of the end of the um, Singoku Tarastrium the, the the domain of the demigods um, emperor and the game's third act tells the narrative of the cycle of creation and destruction and how the game's cosmology follows a fatalist um, trajectory decided by its um, celestial being. So as the story um, progress, it becomes clear and clear that um, the conflict become um, almost exclusively between um, among, among the demigods, which in which that humans plays um, relatively a very little. Um, humans play very little um, factors in in that, and there are and there's also um, uh, we can say like a. Um, final enemy, so in the spider, the golden spider, which is actually the originator of, of the chakra, the originator of the universe um, itself, who argues that the, um, the world has to be created anew as the, um, what was it again, due to the, um, due to the destruction of um, the conflict between the destruction caused, caused by the destruction um, of conflict between the, um, among the demigods, I'm sorry. So this also reflects the, um, I'll say again, the Indian cosmology of the um, the Trimurti, the, the creation, and after creation there are, I'll say it again, uh, are we, the, the 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 destruction and how after the destruction the world's being created and new and being maintained. So we can see that the um, the the narrative um, themes of um, Asura friends follow those of um, Indian epic, but. How can we look at the, um, the formal structure of the game itself, and how the ludic um, structure of the game um, also ref reflects on the um, the uh, again on the Indian um, epic? The simulation of Indian epics in Asura's Red um, first and foremost is how um, Asura's Red is significantly different from its contemporaries, as it is more akin to an interactive anime as opposed to digital games. Um, its ludic affordances are more limited, that is offset by its distinctively um, stylish um, presentation, in which that to, in order to, you can say like, um, to simulate, um, I'll say it again, a fantastic scene does not require um, as much as an effort uh, compared to a more con conventional games. Its content is segmented into multiple short episodes as opposed to more flowing gameplay. So as we look at the picture, um, QTE, uh, the quick time events, is the bread and butter of Asura Threats, so to speak, in which that the, um, the overall um, progression of the game is often um, decided in how well we can execute the, the quick time events. So if we look, at, we look again at the, um, um, at the structure of Indian Epic, we look at how Indian Epic is more, I would say it again, is very uh, formulaic. It's um, what was it again? Something that is more like um, uh, perhaps the analog, the analogous to uh, the performance is how it is a more um, choreograph as opposed to a more um, what was it again uh, spontaneous um, as opposed and in the in the western um, storytelling. And therefore, um, the feature is reflected heavily in Asura's red um, stylish presentation that is that. Um, perhaps can be good, but it can be also bad, um, limits um, players' um, freedom in, in the game. 
and also how we can um, replay the presentation again and again um, in order to receive um, higher rank. So this also similar in, I was it again, how um, the Indian um, epic uh, based on my reading, based on my knowledge is uh, again concerns more with, concerns a lot with the, with the, with the um, repetition and concerned more with, I was again, with consistencies instead of, I was it again, a more subjective um, contingency in the, in the Western um, uh, form of storytelling. The segmentation draws similarity with the episodic uh, narrative structures of Mahakavya and how Asura's read um, representation of Indian mythology and its ludonarrative structure opens an interesting discussion of digital games possibility as a Mahakavya. Perhaps we can um, look at um, other games and starting to find how it is structurally similar to, to Indian epic. So we come to the summary of uh, again uh, my presentation. The cell layer of Asura Sweat is the iconography and themes of Asura Sweat, which are inspired by Indian culture, um, more specifically the again the, the 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 structure and the convention of Indian epic. And the core layer of um, Asura Sweat is the formal structure of Indian epic, which are translated into Asura Sweat's um, ludic structure that creates a distinctive form of um, gameplay and obviously a player experience. However, Asura Sweat still lacks a culturally authentic Indian game text as it is still generally follows a Japanese anime convention of storytelling and presentation and how um, Asura's rap is, um, you can say, like as a compromise bit of the again the influence between the Japanese uh, Buddhism and Indian um, Hinduism. So, what is next? What we can, uh, what I plan to do next with uh, with the uh, with this presentation that hopefully can be um, trans can be uh, again um, fleshed out into a full uh, into, into a full article. There's a new epistemological um, approach in studying uh, digital games and literature by looking at the um, non-Western perspective, uh, non-Western literature as the um, as the cradle, as the um, you can say like the reference in analyzing game text. Uh, game studies are studied with uh, framing digital games as Western uh, literature. Perhaps we ever heard um, Janet Murray's Hamlet on the hollow text that become the uh, again the uh, prototype of um, cyber text of uh, again um, ergodic storytelling as ergodic um, text as we as we know it that become that also becomes uh, key components in understanding video games as a text. Is it possible to diversify the, the discourse? Is it possible to adopt a non-Western um, literature, uh, namely um, Indian epics, and perhaps there are other form of Indian literatures that um, we can discuss that perhaps we can explore more um, as a reference in analyzing game text. And this is also an alternative reading of digital games as a non-Western um, literature, how we can try it once again to diversify in the perspective of digital games um, as, as text. And last but not least, we can see how um, the, again, how Indian, the cultural richness of India um, it's become, uh, you can say, like the the source of um, other cultures, such as uh, again Japanese, such as I was again um, Chinese, all of them which has um, Indian influence, and how we can um, and as as um, those countries, as I was again uh, Japanese, um, as those cultures like Japanese cultures become an influence, uh, influential, um, I was it again, a culture in video games. Is it possible for us to, um, we can say like, um, investigate the cultural richness of India and see how it is actually um, become more closely related to, um, so again, to the video game culture in, in general. Um, thank you very much for um, uh, so again listening to my presentation. I return the, uh, so again, the talk to Sophie. Right. Thank you, Hario. A big thank You're you to all welcome. visitors for their fascinating presentations. Thank you.
Um, I will now open the session to questions, comments, and feedback. First, let's check the chat box, and then I'll open the session to people who would like to unmute themselves and ask questions if they want to. So we already have questions on Ochinto's presentations. Um, right, yes. So, um, so Ochinto, are you there? Oh, yes, you are here. Okay, very well. So Anupav Anand asks, uh, comments that he's interested in knowing why they chose PUBG specifically to get over the boredom. Would you like to take this question, Ochinto? Um, are you there, Ochinto? You can unmute yourself and answer the question if you want to. Yes. Uh, thank you, Shovik. Uh, I have already texted the answer. So I, I, I'm going to just uh, read it uh, out to you. Is that OK? OK, so you have already texted the answer. OK, please read it out to us, because yes. then the rest of us are also going to yes, be able yes, to. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, as, I've, as I have mentioned earlier that uh, teenagers did not have uh, schools, colleges during this lockdown, neither they, they were allowed to play outside, nor did they do any study work at home. And, and uh, the thing is that uh, uh, I am a private tutor and I have watched some of them, how bored they were. So, um, I guess that's why they choose PUBG. However, the exact why they choose it, uh, it's not. Uh, it's uh, it's it is uh, uh, a it's it's a another subject of uh, paper, I think. And, and I have also watched many people on many purples who are are uh, who are, are uh, doing uh, who are who are watching Netflix Netflix for. Uh, for movies and TV series, but uh, the exact why they chose this media, this PUBG player, it's 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 not uh, really um, open to me that why they choose this exact game. Right. That's so it. Here we then have a wonderful research direction for you to take your work forward, right? So I think we would all yes. really like the answer to this particular question: Why exactly PUBG? Why not any other game? Um, so that's yes, an interesting. Work on it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Then um, Hario has also it. asked you something. Um, he has asked you: uh, Is your research related to the COVID nineteen pandemic in India? He says he had read that PUBG became very popular in early days of pandemic in India, as the youth were forced to stay home. So, would you like to say something about this? Um, uh, Oshinto, are you there? Hello, can you yes. hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, as I uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, uh, it's kind of related to uh, lockdown because uh, many of them forced to stay in uh, uh, stay in home and and. Uh, uh, however, my main concern is that uh, do PUBG cause violent behavior? I, I have tried to show that in my paper that uh, to, uh, do uh, playing violent game cause violent behavior or this kind, this kind of uh, uh, questions I have tried to answer in the paper. So uh, you can say it's related to lockdown. But uh, my main concern is that uh, violent video game and its psychological effects. Thank you, Achintya. That's it. Very well. Um, are you are you about to say something? No, no. I just um, okay. um, send my gratitude to Achintya. That that's also related to what I asked on the chat box. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. 
Um, I see that Oritra has raised his arms, uh, raised his raised his hands for an answer. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, you can do so. Not answer, but uh, put a comment on uh, okay. Unam Chaudhary's paper on spirit fair. Okay. One of the interesting things that uh, came to me is that uh, first of all, uh, there are uh, one of the things that you mentioned uh, in the side note that uh, you about the. Varanasi uh, death hostels, uh, I reckon they were called, uh, and the film that you mentioned of Hotel Salvation. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the interesting thing from the poster that uh, struck to me that is the imagery of the uh, imagery of the boat and obvious and also <laughs> the content of the mm. hostel or hotel, and yes. both of these things are are. I felt like both, I mean, both of these things are present very overtly and throughout uh, Spirit Fair because it is essentially creating a sort of hotel and hostel on a ship uh, or boat, so to say. Uh, and uh, that's what I was thinking that, uh, that it is interesting to see uh, the, the, this obviously the totally di from totally different mediums and totally different words, this recurring image. And mm -hmm. I was uh, just asking that, do, may, have you uh, sort of an idea or maybe you can shine a light on uh, the symbolism that uh, these two, the hotel and uh, boat imagery might have to the themes that mm -hmm. are represented uh, in these two works of art. Thank you. I think the boat imagery um, is very, I'm not sure how, this is some, I, I wouldn't even call it a folklore or a folk tale. I'm not sure about the stories that I've grown up with are kind of, you know, homogenous everywhere. But this idea of a boat that, you know, uh, Jom and the Jom Doot, right in Bangla, the, the, there's a lot of reference to this mm -hmm. journey of the afterlife that happens th through, a, through a boat and this lovely lady whose husband was taken away by Jomdu, Jom or Jomdu, I'm not sure. And then she takes that ride to kind of uh, on a boat itself to retrieve her husband from the underworld. Uh, and there are boats, are you right? So many Baul songs are written on, I think. There's been references to uh, boats in a couple of songs, although I don't remember them exactly. Again, these are the things that I've grown up with, so I don't really have very, uh, you know, uh, very explicit memories of them, but these are just some memories that I have. And the hotel thing, right, as point, I, I also brought in spirit fair, spirited away because of that. So I was, I was thinking about that, this idea of seva, right, uh, especially in Sikhism, the idea of taking care of the, taking care of people uh, doesn't matter before death after death but this idea of seva is so ingrained in a lot of our uh, religious philosophies in this country that um maybe to the western audience it may be the game maybe it struck out like the, the the ethic of care maybe it stood out for them but for us it's very natural to take care of the elderly to take care of um to kind of give them that space to contemplate about death uh, and um provide that palliative care in a way uh, that's quite ingrained in our culture, I feel. I hope that answers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. The, the answer. The, I love, love the answer and the question of... Uh, this is, yeah, but this is a work in progress sort of a paper, mm, I, so I have to... Mm, there's mm, a lot to look into. Nah, the answer, I look to a lot of suggestions. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the answer. Lovely. Um, right. So Prabhash has also raised his hands. Would you like to go forward, Prabhash? Just unmute yourself and ask the question if you want. Are you there, Prabhash? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Go on. Thank you so much for the wonderful papers. I have one, I mean, not a question exactly, but uh, 
but a kind of tangent for Poonam and tangent. another uh, another question for for Hario. So uh, Poonam, uh, mm. since you're talking about palliative care, mm -hmm. I am also very uh, I was very intrigued because palliative care has uh, like constantly talks about care, and one of the problems mm -hmm. that they face is. Uh, is to provide spiritual care to the people who mm -hmm, are mm -hmm. going to die, right? That is one of their agendas. You know Monica, right? She was working, yes. she was interning with interning with Palliative Care India. And there it was a problem. They had to create a manual for spiritual care. And the, mm. the problems that they were facing was mm -hmm. whether you go in the religious direction or you do not. Correct. Because uh, it also wants to create this uh, non, then how many religions do you in, mm. uh, include mm -hmm, and all mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. So Precisely. I was also mm -hmm. thinking. I was also thinking that this uh, this game in itself and the analysis that you've provided might be very interesting to approach a different kind of spiritual care for 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 people who are. Uh, I mean, like provides a different outlook mm -hmm. and maybe maybe uh, that can be done in a certain way or uh, you can get in touch with them or something like that. You know, because it's yeah. fascinating how you yeah. deal with. Uh, Mm -hmm. this game you know it's it's um it's kind of very central to them and uh, yeah that was my comment for you it was amazing a bit uh for hario i um uh, i am uh kind of intrigued by what you're saying on one hand on the other i am very skeptical about it as well because uh because uh because these these forms, these epics in India are also political spaces. I'm sure you have read A.K. Ramanujan's 300 Ramayans and various redemptions of Mahabharat itself. So the Mahakavya format is kind of, uh, it's an interesting format, but uh, in India, uh, when we discuss all this, it's, it's kind of becomes very, uh, very problematic, you see, and very political at the same time. So uh, I also wanted to know how you're going to navigate that political space as a literary form because it's a highly Sanskritized form to begin with. While well, while Ramayana is a is a Mahakavya, Mahabharata is not a Mahakavya; it is an Itihasa. So uh, how are you dealing with that? And also the variations that are um, that are like subalterns also practice various women also practice Ramayana in a different way. And that is not a Mahakavya format. It's a bal it's a it's a kind of singing format in which they talk about Ramayana in a different way. So yeah, I was just oh, wondering if you could respond to that. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Prabhash. Yeah, so yeah, um, um, obviously I'm still um, again grasping the knowledge about the Indian epic and how we can classify, um, how we can um, identify the various forms um, of it. And thank you for us again. It was a very um, informative um, comments um, from you to say about also this one is a different form of, of again, um, Indian um, art, we can, we can say like that. So um, definitely it will um, it will make me to refine um, the, the research into something that is more accurate, into something that is more, I'll say it again, um, true to its, uh, again, to their distinctive forms. And also when it comes to um, political, um, this is something that is um, uh, perhaps a new a new knowledge uh, uh, for me because um, when, we, when, you come from, when we come from Indonesia, we look at, um, I'll say it again, um, Indian um, epic as, as a, perhaps as a pure form of art. We do not take into consideration the, the political um, aspect. Um, of that definitely something that is interesting to 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 look and how um, what was it again is we can draw some we can call like um, perhaps a connection between perhaps the the, the political um, aspects of um, Indian epic of Mahakavya and the um, uh, again the state of of um, perhaps the um, the video games. Um, the the socio economic context of video game um, themselves, perhaps something like that that I can uh, try to connect um, in the future. Um, in any cases, I would like to send out again. I would like to thank you very much, much for um, giving me a new insight about the again the Indian the the again the, um, the the aspect of um, Indian culture and also um, as, as 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 an outsider that this is something that is. Um, truly inv uh, valuable information. Thank you very much, Prabash. Right. Um, 
So that answers um, Prabhash's comments and questions. And we also have Ishan who has raised his own hand also. Um, Ishan, if you would like to unmute yourself and go forward. Yeah. Hi, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Go on. So my question is for Poonam. Uh, thank you for your lovely presentation. Now, I had one question. It's possible I, I missed the little bit in the beginning, so it's possible I missed this. But I had a question about uh, what happens, how the game addresses mm -hmm. afterlife, how Spirit Fairer addresses the afterlife rather than the crossing over between life and death. So I was just mm -hmm. asked, how the game, like you said that the spirit fairer is helping spirits cross over from the land of the living to that of the dead, right? So is there mm -hmm. any implication or any implication of what happens after that? How they are treated after, how they're treated based on their actions in life? It's just... Right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, the thing is the, that all the characters in the game, all the spirits that do sh that show up on the ship are None of them are bad people, okay? So the, the karma meter that they have is not that off that they would kind of meet with a bad ending of sorts. And they all, even the ones that seem quite rude or quite um, evil in the beginning, they turn out, it later turns out that they've had their reasons and they're quite nice um, at the heart of things. So maybe the karma, there's no such thing in the game but then again on the surface when you play the game you think oh it's about this fairy fairy master and she's helping this uh, uh, spirits to cross over but then when the game progresses we realize that that was just the surface in reality the game is about her own memories her own attachments that and she is on her deathbed and she is uh, kind of making this world up in her own mind. But yes, the game, I think the game deliberately kind of leaves a lot of loose ends like that, as in we do not have, so we, in, uh, so I might, what I think is that these, uh, she, these patients who passed away, um, they, they're kind of going to the afterlife. This is sort of a limbo state where she is dropping them off to a certain kind of a, Kind of a doorway from because the ever door is well, the name itself has a door in it and uh, from then on from there onwards they are going towards the unknown afterlife but the, but the in between from where she picks up picks up the spirits and she drops them off that in between that ship phase is uh, where they kind of uh, make peace with their death make peace with the things that they didn't get to do things that they are uh, you know, repentant about, uh, they want to, things that they feel sad about, etc. So yeah, I feel that the ship phase is kind of a limbo space, not limbo, not in a biblical way, but more like a, a confusing space that we, we don't know what, uh, we, we don't know what's coming, we don't know where we came from, but we just there on the ship with her ferry master. Right, that answers Ishan's question. Thank you, Poonam. Um, we also have a question from Shovik Mukherjee uh, for Hario. Um, he asks, the Indian epic has the scope of being adapted. It takes on multiple different endings and forms, for example, in the Sri Lankan Ramayana and Javanese Ramayana, which is closer home to you. Do you think that the Japanese video game carries on in this tradition? The Ashura is not the standard protagonist of the Indian epics, but there are variations on this theme. Okay, thank you very much, um, Sophie. Um, okay, you see. Okay, the Japanese video game. Um, so, the, the, is, is that question refers to, let's say, um, how. Oh, oh, I see, I see. So, does the um, Indian uh, again um, epic is ever being um, localized into a Japanese um, uh, context? Is that's the again the the essence of the the, the question? Um, perhaps in a sense of the uh, most it again the the epic um, itself. That's is again. There's not that I 
I, I, I know of that the um, because Japanese has a very um, um, again, uh, separated uh, form between their I was it again the, the Shinto religion and the um, the influence of the uh, um, Indian uh, Buddhist religion. So when it comes to the um, the mythology and the religion is very um, um, separated. Um, however, if we look at the um, um, several part of the uh, the Indian cosmology, um, it often being translated into the into the context of a Japanese um, um, culture. For example, I was it again the um, the you can say like the 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 cycle of how's it again the reincarnation for example that it has something to do with the it, it's it's rooted in the in the hindu buddhist um, approach of um, people's um, journey from again from born to being um, enlightened something like that that's it also has a its own um, again um, a local japanese um, um a version you can say like that all of it with, with their own local names but the concept is similar to those uh, that come from from india something like that and also several how's it again a mythical um, creatures, several yokais, such as so again the Asuras itself, and then there are also the the Rasetsu or the Rakshasa in uh, Indian uh, again um, mythology also has its influence from from the um, how's it again uh, from the Japanese. So with if we look at the um, uh, localized into uh, how's it again the the local. Uh, Japanese context, and perhaps um, it's not that I know of, but when it comes to um, into into uh, again the Japanese um, context, because um, once again we look at the um, something like um, uh, the, the, the the yeah you mentioned a Japanese uh, Ramayana yeah yeah it's it's, it's a very um, popular um, art form um, in Indonesia due to uh, how's it again especially in the island of Java due to the strong um, influence of Hindu as the dominant religion in the in Java Island before the arrival of Islam. So I, I think that uh, Japan never experienced that uh, religious face of the mythology is being translated into that. So I hope that answers the, um, the, the question, um, Sophie. Uh, yes, thank you, Hario. I was just kind of talking about the multiplicity of the Indian epic form and how it can be adapted and uh, like in the 19th century, the Bengali poet Michael Mushan and Dr. Rota uh, wrote a variation, uh, Meghnath Bad Kabbu, where, uh, I mean, uh, Ravan and Meghnath, his son, uh, they're, they're, they're almost kind of heroic in stature. So, uh, so, and there is now a comic series called the Ravanayan, where Ravan is the hero, really. So all these kind of traditions, but uh, of course, then as Prabhash said, that there is also there is also this rigidifying kind of tendency of kind of these epics in in uh, politics, in pol political discourse as well. That's true. But I was just talking about kind of how these epics can be adapted. And uh, for example, I mean, although uh, Asuras are not kind of normally uh, protagonists in epics, maybe there is scope for all that really in, in the Indian epic form. So, yeah, and I was really curious and interested to know about the Javanese Ramayan. I, oh, I was, uh, yeah, this is kind of, uh, it was very, very interesting. This is the variation. It's not the same as as, as what we get in Valmiki Ramayana or or in kind of like North Indian, other other variations of Ramayana or in Bengal in Tutti Vashi Ramayana. So yeah, so that's just, you know, thank you very much. That, you know, so. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome, uh, Sophie. Bye. Okay, so um, there is also another question, and this is for Zinia and Satyajit. So this is from Shovik Mukherjee, who asks, would you consider making a game on the Barwari Durga Puja tradition, as it is more common than the elite Zavidarbari or Bonidi Pujas, and an essential part of the Bengali Durga Puja culture? Mm -hmm. And the second one is, <laughs> the second one is one centered on on uh, on a joint celebration in um, in the case of Helsinki or as Satyajit said before, uh, in many um, like global communities beyond India. So usually the community rents a fest hall of some sorts, uh, decorates it jointly and so on. And they have a pandal and everything. So the first one was um, on this uh, very specific, yes, um, um, mansion puja. 
a kind of a zamindari home, uh, but the second one is not. <laughs> Satyajit, do you want to add? Oh, yeah. Mm, Barwari puja is kind of like a more common thing that we experience here in Calcutta. Most of the pujas are Barwari puja. So Barwari puja is, is uh, the, uh, the puja that we, we uh, covered in the, uh, the second game, uh, the Durga puja beyond borders is more like a Barwari Puja, uh, you can say that, than a Zavindar Bari Puja. So there is like a feeling of community coming together and doing something together and managing the thing together. So that is a kind of like a Barwari Puja act <laughs> abroad, you know. So uh, we kind of like covered that, but uh, of course, like you cannot replace the theme pandas and stuff that goes on in Barwari Puja in Calcutta. So that uh, should add a new kind of dimension if we do take such a project in the future. Of course, we would love to do that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thank you so much. Um, so any further questions? And if anybody wants to ask any further questions, you can just unmute yourselves and ask. Right. Okay, then. Um, so I think we should wrap up now. Uh, it's been a long day, but it's been a very fruitful and very fascinating day for us. Um, I personally have got a lot of games recommended to me uh, just by watching the presentation. So thanks, everyone. Um, so that brings to an end our sessions for today. I would like to thank all the participants for the wonderful discussion and a fascinating session. We will resume tomorrow morning. And we hope to see you there for the second and final day of the conference. Have a lovely evening and see you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone.